Jeremiah chapter 6. I'll leave everything out. Uh, so people have different reasons why they didn't turn in their homework, right? So Kate and I were looking, we were, we were finding some lists of reasons why people don't turn in their homework, and we copied down some of our favorites. Uh, this one, my family got, my family got a paper shredder, and we got kind of too much into seeing how well it worked. Um, uh, this next one, I made my worksheet into a paper airplane, and it got hijacked. <laughs> my sister's friend was showing me how much paper she could eat. Um, I didn't do my history homework, because I don't believe in dwelling in the past. <laughs> uh, our furnace broke, and we had to burn everything paper just to keep from freezing to death. It was death or do my homework, and so obviously priorities. Um, this one, I did my homework in my head and then forgot it at home. <laughs> I couldn't do my math homework because my calculator is solar powered and it was overcast. <laughs> I, I really dug into my religion and found out that doing homework is against my religion. Our, our Wi-Fi was acting funny and Alexa kept giving me the wrong answers. <laughs> Uh, and then this one, uh, my dad forgot to do it. <laughs> so um, over the weekend, uh, Claire uh, found another reason why you uh, might not turn in your homework. Um, the, the cold weather, uh, the mice around northwest Indiana have been uh, looking for warm places, and my house is, is one of them. So uh, Claire had her bug collection all ready to, to bring in today, Brother Shrock. She had it laid out there in the front room. Saturday, she and my wife, she'd been collecting bugs, and then she poked them all to her board, had all her nice uh, lettering, <laughs> and it was a buff A uh, for the mice on Saturday night. Sunday morning, they came out, and they had eaten her bug collection. <laughs> So, Mrs. Bishop, have mercy. <laughs> the mice ate my homework. <laughs> so, um, my, uh, so, again, so needless to say, we, we got on Amazon last night and we declared war. You know, we're buying everything to, to kill the mice. And so stuff will be coming all week, packages to, to lay them out and take back our house. Um, uh, so my wife yesterday, so my wife does really good keeping the kitchen clean. And, and so Saturday night she went to bed, girls, you're going to clean the kitchen. And so she comes down Sunday morning and there's water in the sink. And, the, and she, you know, you clean, clean everything and you drain the water. You don't leave the water in there. And then she sees the dish rag floating there. And she says, you don't leave the dish rag in the water. You know, those are some of my rules. Abigail's already like, <gasps> Yep. So she's like, girls, as she's reaching for the dish rag, which wasn't a dish rag. You know my one rule about not, you know, draining the sink, not leaving the dish rag, and she grabs a mouse. <laughs> begins wringing it out. Still thinking, boy, you know, rags get really slimy when they sit in the water. And so she's like, girls, this, as she turns, and it is not a dish rag. She did not handle that well. <laughs> um, so anyway, taking back the house, taking back the house. And so I'm out driving, I'm out in Black Oak uh, driving a bus and getting all these texts, you know, that, that catastrophe has descended on my house. And uh, so it's, you know, at, at, at those long stops, you know, trying to, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, help my family. So anyway, what a, what a message last night, wasn't it? 
on, on, on even just the idea of, oh, Lord, give me back my tears. And for some of us, give me tears. Um, give me tears for, for, for souls. Um, I want to talk about um, living on the old paths. Uh, there in Jeremiah 6, 16, it says, uh, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. And here's, here it is, ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein? Really, those two, those two phrases, ask for the old paths and walk therein. Ask for the old paths and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk therein. There was a rebellion and a stubbornness. We see what God wanted, and they wanted something else. And it's sad because there's things that God says, I want this. And you, and you say, well, I, I'm doing pretty good. And that's all you get for now. I'm doing pretty good. And can't, don't I get credit for doing pretty good? I know you want this. And I'm working on figuring out a way to maybe let you have that someday. But for now, I have other interests that occupy this much of my attention. And they don't allow for that just yet. So be happy with what you get, God, for now. So we want to make sure, um, and again, he's talking to God's people, right? The Israelites. And here we are in this room, God's people. We want to make sure that uh, we, we watch that heart of ours. The easiest place to backslide is in Bible college, right? You get busy. I don't really have to pray. We do that every class. We do that at chapel. We do that at church. I don't, I don't have time to pray. Someday, again, my life is hectic. I... I, I school and work and ministries, and I, I agree. Hey, I agree. It takes up a lot of time. And that's when you think, I, I don't have time for my own study. I'm getting it in every class. I'm, I'm getting it in chapel. I don't have time for just that quiet time with the Lord. Guarding my heart, asking for those old paths, and being careful to walk therein. Let's, let's pray, and then we'll uh, get into this. Lord, we love you. I just pray that you be with this, uh, these, this sermon, Lord. Help me to use the time wisely. Get across the main things that you've laid on my heart. And I just pray that you be with this time, Lord. Uh, help us to walk out of this room uh, uh, a little closer to you than we came in. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I've been reading this book on prayer. I thought I'd read a couple quotes to you. Uh, prayer, this is E.M. Bounds. Prayer must be continuous, particular, always, everywhere, and in everything. Many people believe in the efficacy of prayer, but not many people pray. Prayer is the easiest and hardest of all things. It is the simplest and most sublime, the weakest and most powerful. Its results lie outside the range of human possibilities. They are limited only by the omnipotence of God. The church too often seems almost wholly unaware of the power God has placed at her disposal. We do everything for the heathen except the one thing that would help them. Amen. The sad confession must be made but that we are not praying very much. Our people are not essentially a praying people. Prayer is a trade to be learned. It is a life trade. We must be apprentices and serve our time at it. Painstaking care, much thought, practice, and labor are required to be skillful tradesmen. In praying, one who is clumsy in the trade of praying will also mishandle the trade of salvation. Prayer and a holy life are one. Neither can survive alone. The piety of saints is made, refined, and perfected by prayer. Boy, don't we, uh, Brother uh, Betrell yesterday kind of reminded us of the idea of we, we want to be proper Christians, right? We want to be careful when we push God on people. Not right away. Got to build that relationship first. And we find that it never comes. We find that our propriety as a Christian causes us not to have any piety as a Christian. And walking with God and praying and say, Holy Spirit, guide me. Yet last night, boy, Brother, brother Petrell, right? Driving by and the Holy Spirit saying, Stop at this house. <laughs> and you're like, Ah, oh, that's a great story. I want the stories. They preach well. I just, I don't want to have that life of submission that it requires to have those stories. I don't want to be driving along and have the Holy Spirit interrupt my day 
and say, let's pull over and check on this house. I've got things that I'm doing for God. I'm so busy doing things for God, I can't do the things that God wants. Right, and I'm there. I'm, not pre I'm preaching it myself today. But I want you to think about some of these things. A holy life does not live in the closet, but it cannot live without the prayer closet. Oh my, we need to spend that time on our knees. Getting a hold of God's heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, of course, warns us of the deceptiveness of our own heart. We don't churn up our own heart and go out to serve God. We spend the time getting a hold of God's heart. And that's a big difference. It is so very vitally important. Now, I'm going through the Bible. My family is with the church. But I'm also going through Dave Olson's uh, uh, Morning Light. Uh, and this is uh, through the year, um, the Old Testament books of law, history, and prophets. And it was pretty fun that the very passage we're looking at today was the very passage that was for um, tomorrow, or, uh, today, yesterday, and Saturday. Let me read a couple of the things that he gives kind of by way of giving us a little context here. So a lot of it is the heart. And again, they, had the, they did not have the heart to obey, did they? They said, uh, we will not walk therein. So being a Christian isn't a matter of trying harder. It's having the heart that says, oh God, you promised to help me both to will and to do your good pleasure. I'm coming to you. I'm begging you to make good on that promise. Help me to want to do what you want me to do. Help me to love you enough to make sure that happens. It's a heart issue. We don't try harder. We trust more. All right, so here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Saturday was the day that they covered that, that he covered Jeremiah 5 and 6 and, and covered this. Jeremiah 5:23, he says, "A rebellious heart. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. Rebellion is a matter of the heart. It is a refusal to listen, to obey. Uh, yesterday we heard of, of God's call to Judah to repent and return to him. And that was really good. October 2nd, Jeremiah 3, 22. Return ye backsliding children and I will heal your backslidings. The promise is there. But we aren't often interested in victory over sin. We like our sin too much. Victory is there if we care to have it. So in Jeremiah 5, 23, there was, they refused to return. Uh, they had a re revolting and rebellious heart. Revolt means to turn away. In other words, the people did the exact opposite of what they were told. There's the traits of rebellion. There's disobedience is the first one. The response to God's offer of a restful path, that's our text for today, was we will not walk therein. Then we see disinterest. When it came to God's word, they had, verse 10, no delight in it. Be careful when your interest in the Bible begins to wane. Yesterday, Pastor Betrell, led, uh, he, he started his sermon by reading a lengthy passage out of John chapter 4. Remember? The woman at the well? Uh, so I pulled out my notes. I like to take notes in church. It helps me follow what's going on a little bit better. But that, there's not a lot to write down as he's reading his passage. And so my mind began to wander. Oh, I'm going to bring my mind back once he gets to the points, to the content of the message. And my mind went here and there. And finally, after that lengthy passage was done, he prayed. And I was thinking about this sermon that I was going to deliver to you guys today. And I said, oh, God, your word was just read, and my mind went everywhere else. I'm waiting for the content of the sermon, but your word was read, and I allowed my mind to wander when your word was being read. And as Pastor Betrell prayed for the blessing on his sermon, I was praying, oh God, forgive me. I don't have enough respect for your word to lock my brain on, on, on the reading of your precious word. Help me, Lord, to get my priorities straight. I want to get the points in my notebook. But as your word was preached, my mind was everywhere else. Forgive me. They had no delight. Be careful when your interest in God's word begins to wane. Though the Lord pleaded with them to listen to his warnings of judgment, they said in verse 17, we will not hearken. 
When we refuse to listen and obey, we are headed for trouble. Because of Judah's rebellion, God declared, I will bring evil, trouble, upon this people. 619. Rebellion promises pleasure, but produces problems. Young man, I was where you are, and rebellion feels good. I'm telling you, it feels good. It feels really good to be a little angry, a little rebellious. I was there. I remember the feeling. All right? And it promises feelings uh, of power, and, and it just feels good. Don't give in to those things. Ask God, help me not, not to have that rebellious heart. Lord, help me not to have that false feeling of power that rebellion gives. You said that you would give me power as I witness for you and live that clean life. Then the devil has that cheap counterfeit. Don't give in to that. Our stubbornness causes us to lose blessings. Chapter 5, verse 25. Your sins have withholden good things from you. Um, that, was, that was so good. And then today, actually, one day after he talked about, he preached last night on tears, um, he, he talked today about the heart of a servant. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were a fountains of tears that I might weep day and night for my people. He had a sorrowful heart. He wept until he had no more tears to shed. He had a separated heart. He hated their sins and wished he could dwell in the wilderness and go from them. He wasn't comfortable around their sin. He had a submitted heart. Even though it hurt him to stay around the sinful people, he understood God wanted him to remain with them as God's spokesman. Uh, verse, chapter 10, verse 19, Truly this is a grief and I must bear it. And he had that supplicating heart, that heart that we just talked about with prayer. He brought his griefs and frailties to the Lord. Chapter 10, verse 20, uh, 24, O oh Lord, correct me. Oh, Lord, correct me. Today we're going to talk about the old paths. All right, so there in Jeremiah 6, 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So I'm, I'm going to give you a bunch of S's. You ready? Um, so the first thing is there's, there's submission with this old path, their submission. Uh, the first thing it says is, thus saith the Lord. You know what? He had, the, the, the thus saith the Lords have been in the Bible for many, 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 many years, and most of the people on this planet don't care. Thus saith the Lord. And the sad thing is, he could have said, thus saith the Lord, and read John chapter 4 last night, and my mind was everywhere else. There was a lack of submission. The Lord is speaking, and he's looking for someone who will care that he is speaking. And a lot of the people in Baptist uh, Bible colleges, they're too busy to care what God has to say. Someday when my life slows down, I'll listen a little bit better. But life doesn't slow down. You have to make it slow down and prioritize and build into it those important times. You find time to do the things that are important to you. It's like, wow, everyone came into my class with Dunkin' Donuts coffees. You all had, a, you had time for a run over there before your 7.30 class. That's amazing. You had time to do the things that were important to you. Oh, my friend, make these things important. Now, part of submission, I have two things. Bow the ear and bend the knee. Bow the ear and bend the knee. Proverbs 5, verse 1, talks about bending the ear. Uh, I'm sorry, bowing the ear. I said them backwards. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. We have thoughts that are important to us, and then God has thoughts that are just flat important. And we don't set aside our thoughts to listen to what he has to say. Um, someday, God will probably bless most all of you with children. And they'll be looking at you as you give them instructions, and you see that blank stare in their face. They're looking at you, but their mind is on other things. And they're getting the gist of what you're telling them, but they're not really getting what you're telling them. The gist is not enough. There's instructions in there. And uh, you can tell. Um, so children are often absorbed in their own thoughts as they 
stare at you um, but are not really listening. Every day, make sure you have that heart of submission that says, oh God, you're speaking and I won't care enough unless you help me. I want to care. Please help me. I want to care. Please help me. Bow the ear and then bend the knee. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 24, verses 41 through 42, not my will, but thine be done. We bend that knee. He bent his knee before the Father, not my will. And for him, you say, hit. His will was always the same with the Father. What, what will is he setting aside here? And I don't presume to talk for the Lord Jesus in there, but I think for him, he had always been one with his Father, and he was entering a moment of separation, and he did not like the separation that he was going to have to endure as he went to the cross and became sin for us, and the Father turned his back. I don't want that, but I'll do it because it's your will. And both of us love the end results, the joy that's set before us, you and me. Amen. Not my will, but thine be done. That's that submission where we make sure everything else is set aside. We open the Bible and say, oh God, I'm not going to pay attention like I should unless you, you got to help me. Please help me to lock my heart and my mind on what you have to say. Uh, Philippians 2.10 reminds us that every knee will bend one day, huh? And bow and confess that he is Lord. Let's practice now. Let's get good at it. So it's only natural. It'll be very unnatural for some, but I, wanna, I don't want it to be natural for me. So there's a submission. Then he also says here in the verse, uh, uh, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the way. So my second point is stand, stand. Now it takes strength to stop sometimes. And people get upset with you. I was imagining, just get on 94, get in the middle lane and just stop. <laughs> you know, slow down and people will be upset with you. They'll be honking. They'll be angry as people. <laughs> There's a flow on 94 and you stop, you're disrupting the flow. And there's a flow of culture around us. And we're so proper that we're afraid to disrupt the flow of culture around us. And we need to disrupt that flow. Stand. Stop. Haggai says, consider your ways. Don't let culture carry you along. Stand and stop and think some things through. Be still and know that he is God. There's a stillness. That was Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know. Make sure God has your undivided attention so he can speak with you. With standing, there's a stillness. And with standing, it takes some strength, doesn't it? To stop when culture's flowing around you. There will be people upset. But God will provide the strength we need to stand. Let me go back to Ephesians chapter 6 real fast. Ephesians chapter 6. It says this about standing. Chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And then we jump down to verse 13 and 14. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Stand. There's a stillness that we're reminded that will be important. And there's a strength. There's that power that God is oh so ready to give. But stand. Consider your ways, Haggai 1.7. Then the third thing is see. He says here, uh, uh, stand ye in the ways and see. And see. Open your eyes. One of the things, uh, um, we want to see that we are headed in the wrong direction. Uh, a different one of these uh, from October 4th, yesterday, Jeremiah 7 and 8, uh, his lesson was, which way are you heading? They hearkened not, Jeremiah 7, 24, but walked in the counsels of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. 
Though judgment was pending, the Lord called upon his people to repent, saying, Amend your ways and your doings, verse 3. Sadly, his efforts to restore Judah had been rejected repeatedly. He testified, Jeremiah 7, 13, I called you, but ye answered not. Unfortunately, the stubborn attitude had become ingrained in their nation from one generation to another. Jehovah reminded them that their forefathers had treated him the same way. Um, but they hearkened not and went backward and not forward. In Jeremiah 8.5, Judah had become guilty of a perpetual backsliding. Uh, consider what happens when you fail to amend your ways. First, your actions affect your children. Uh, in Judah's case, they not only learned to act like their fathers, but Jeremiah 7.26 did worse than their fathers. Next, when you fail to listen to God, you can only move in one direction, backward and not forward. Following your heart will cause you to backslide. All forward movement stops in the Christian life when you disobey God. If you are presently going backward, Turn around. It'll be hard. God is big. And he will help. So we want to stand. And we want to see. There's two things with seeing. Um, by the way, twice in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 14.12 and Proverbs 14.25, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. All right, we can't go along those paths. There has to be a trust there where we're listening to leadership and, and we're spending time getting a hold of God's heart each and every day. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 reminds us we walk by faith and not by sight. Two things with seeing, I want to talk about caution and concentration. Caution and concentration. Caution, we see there in uh, Ephesians 5, 15, uh, the Bible says, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. That's a children's song, isn't it? Uh, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Right? Circumspect. Spect, we have the idea of spectacles, and, and circum is, is, is around, so we're looking around. There's a caution. We're heedful of circumstances. Uh, we're, we're, we're thinking before we act. We're, we're almost like, it seems like the Bible should say something along the lines of uh, acknowledging God in all our ways and leaning not on our own understanding and, and letting him direct our paths, right? Wouldn't that be nice if it was somewhere? And I think I would tuck it in Proverbs 3 somewhere. All right, so caution, but then there's also a concentration. Doesn't the Bible tell us in Hebrews 12 to looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? He really is the old path. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the old path. As we concentrate on him, he's, he never changes. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me turn back to uh, Hebrews. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. It says this, Hebrews 10, 20. Um, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Oh my, looking unto Jesus. I love that old story about the young man that was uh, uh, putting furrows in his dad's uh, farmland. And he says, Dad, you always make the furrows so straight. How do you do it? And he says, well, I actually just, I, I, pick, I pick something in the next guy's farm and I just, I just drive toward it the whole time. And I just, the whole time I'm driving toward it, when I look back, my furrows are straight. Then off of that, I have straight lines. Wow, that's wonderful. So he, he, he made his first line and came back and got dad. Dad comes out and sees the furrows are doing this. And he says, uh, son, you didn't do what I said. He said, no, I, I completely did what you said. And it didn't make a lot of sense because when I, when I locked my eyes on that guy's horse... You know what your eyes are locked on makes a big difference. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus. 
Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. When your eyes are locked on him, at the end of your life, you can look back and there'll be those straight lines. What did our guest speaker say last week? Praise God that God can even make a straight line with a crooked stick. Wasn't that a blessing? Wasn't that a blessing? And we're that crooked stick. But if we're in his hand, God can make a straight line with us. Ah, oh, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And so uh, we see caution and concentration. Then, the next thing in our verse, uh, we have something to say. So, uh, well, submission, thus saith the Lord, standing, standing in the way. There's a seeing. And now the Bible says, ask for the old paths. Ask for the old paths. So we have something to say. We have something to say. Ask for those old paths. God's word provides the old paths of salvation by grace through faith in Christ and godly living. So when we ask for those old paths, the Bible says to study, right? To show yourself approved unto God. Get in the book and study history. Uh, to some degree, dwell in the past. Dwell in the past, even though our jokes said, I don't like to dwell in the past. We understand history, we study, and then we understand it's his story. It's all about him, and it always has been. And my friend, it always will be. So we understand history. We have the only inspired history book. By the way, not all of the old paths are good. Let me read Job 22, verse 15. Job, one of the earliest books of the Bible. Job 22, 15. It says this. Well, let me get over there. Um, Hast thou marked down the old way which wicked, uh, which wicked men have trodden? Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Uh, Jude warns us in uh, uh, Jude, verse 11, about the way of Cain. That's a pretty old way. The first human being ever born. That's a pretty old way, just because it's old. But there's these, there's these things that we can do when we ask for those old paths. And first, we're, at, we're going to God and saying, I, I want those old paths, the important ones. I want you to help me find the right way. Uh, we've all been there, right? Where you get to a new town, and you're like, I don't know where to go. Let me stop and ask somebody. Uh, there's so many roads, I don't know where to go. And when God gives you a little light and you respond to that light and you're doing, you're living obediently, there's all these paths. God has a way of bringing people into your life that will help you get in those right paths. And this place is one of them. God has you here helping you to establish some of those right paths. So we understand history. And we're warned that not all of those old paths are proper. Let me read Psalm chapter 1 real quickly. Psalm chapter 1. Reminds us, um, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And so right there, what does Dr. Sorensen say about this chapter? He says basically, get out of the world, get into the word. Get out of the world, get into the word. Why? Because it gets us on the proper way. Uh, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I like that. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, that's what we're studying today, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Understanding history is so important. Let me read Deuteronomy 32, verse 7. Deuteronomy 32, verse 7 says this. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. Think, study, study to show yourself approved unto God. Ask, please, does anyone know where that right way is? Oh God, show me, send someone to help me. I want to be on those right paths. And God will make sure, if you have that heart, God will make sure you're on that right path. 
And then understand once again, it's his story. It's his story. It's all about the Lord Jesus. It's all about the Lord Jesus. Then, the next thing in our chapter, or our verse, uh, it says, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Uh, where is the good way? And then our next point, walk therein. Live your life on that path. Live your life on the old paths. Walk therein. Uh, so my S word is sojourn. Sojourn. A sojourner is someone that, that lives somewhere uh, temporarily. Uh, our home is somewhere else. Uh, so the, the, we're, we're sojourning in this life. And there are some paths that we need to walk until we get to our true home. Right? So we sojourn in the path of salvation. Um, the way, we need to accept it. We sojourn on the path of sanctification. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 through 17, God says, I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. When you're saved, your practice must catch up to the position that God has given you in himself. And then we sojourn in the paths of service. Nehemiah 8.10 reminds us that there's joy in serving Jesus. Ephesians 2.8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Get busy. Get busy. I thank God that I got really sick, Brother Schrock. I got really sick for over a week. And some of the interests that I had that dominated too much of my attention while I was down, I'm like, wow, those things don't mean anything. God, you have my attention. You have my attention. Those things that had too much of my attention, they don't have my attention right now. It was like a reset button in my life. And God, help me to be a little more careful of what I allow into my life that capitalizes on the attention that I have. Because I can only be attentive to so many things. Help me to be careful. Thank you for that reset button in my life. Help me to use it wisely and be close to you. Walk in those paths. There's service, there's true joy in serving Jesus. Then he says, uh, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Rest unto your souls. So there we have safety. Safety. We have rest for our souls. I love that verse in Isaiah chapter, uh, uh, let's see, 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Uh, uh, we, we love it. We love it. Isaiah, let me get there. <laughs> Isaiah 26 verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now my son, well, he's, big, he's getting big now, but when he was little, nothing, there were no problems that were bigger than dad. If he's walking with dad, there's nothing that's going to scare him because dad's with him. The truth is there's problems on this earth that are bigger than me. But when you got a little kid with dad, right? Pastor Smith's little boy, he's, he's, dad's Superman, if, I, if I'm close to dad, I'm fine. If I'm away from dad, things will get scary. But if I'm with dad, everything's good. And Amos 3, 3, can two walk together? Except they're agreed. Every morning, get a hold of God's heart and walk with him. Walk with him. And when you're walking close to Jesus, those problems that have you scared to death are oh so small. Because I'm with my heavenly father. I'm with Jesus. I'm with God. Nothing can happen. Now, there are problems bigger than Pastor Smith. His little boy only thinks he's Superman. There are problems bigger than me. My little boy is starting to see that. He's not so little anymore. But there's no problem bigger than your Heavenly Father. You walk with Him. You, you get yoked up with Him, right? We talked about that the other day, Matthew chapter 11. You get yoked up with Him and you learn of Him and you work with Him and you become a fellow laborer with Him. And you have that peace and safety and that security. Oh, there's nothing like it. We talked about a little bit of drama. Um, now, a, a good story, you need a little bit of drama, right? You have a David, you need a Goliath. That makes for a good story. But we bring the wrong kind of drama into our life. Oh, life is way too peaceful with Jesus. I'm going to allow myself this other drama so my life gets a little more interesting. I'm going to distance myself with Jesus and have a little adventure. Oh, that's the wrong kind of drama. 
There's enough drama that comes into your life when you're a David walking with the Lord and you got those Goliaths. That's a better drama. Take out those Goliaths. That's wonderful. You distance yourself from God to see what happens. Oh, it's awful. And you hurt people and you're miserable. Not a good idea. You, your sense of adventure, don't let it take you down that path. That's the wrong path. Boy, in the end, they said, we will not walk therein. I'm not interested. What about you today? Are you interested? Can you let go of those things and be a little more careful to be on that right path? So the last S is stubbornness. Stubbornness. You want it, God, but I want something else. And my interests are far too important to me. Let's not be that way. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Go.